So hi all. Uh, it's a great pleasure and honor to have Stefano Profumo from University of California, Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz Institute for Particle Physics with us in our uh, Quantum Aspects of Space, Time and Matter Zuminar series, which I have started very long time ago during COVID, like I think 2000 uh, specifically. And uh, Stefano gave a talk on that series. So then I have stopped it in the end of 2011. Now, recently I have thought that it should be started again. It would be helpful for students, researchers, and uh, this type of uh, uh, important uh, talks, discussions are very much uh, useful. So uh, then I have asked Stefano to give this talk and he immediately agreed. Thanks Stefano for uh, your uh, kind gesture. So uh, today he is going to talk about black holes and dark matter. Uh, Stefano, you can start. And thank you so much, Sayantan, for the honor of opening this uh, seminar series again. And uh, thank you for having me today. Um, just before uh, the seminar, uh, Sayantan Gosh, Dr. Sayantan Gosh, was mentioning my book on particle dark matter. Um, and in fact, I've devoted most of my scientific career to thinking about dark matter as a particle. Uh, however, today, uh, the talk will be about a different possibility. That is, that dark matter is a macroscopic object. Uh, it's not a quantum object for all intents and purposes. Uh, and in fact, today, I will discuss the possibility that dark matter be uh, black holes. Uh, let me start by going back to basics. Uh, when we think about dark matter, it is important to think about what defines a particle. A particle is defined uh, utilizing a famous uh, mathematical physics theorem by Eugene Wigner as uh, an irreducible uh, representation of uh, uh, the Lorentz group, or rather the Poincaré group. And all such irreducible unitary representations are labeled completely by two uh, quantities. One is the mass and the other is uh, the spin, which is of course a half integer or an integer uh, number J. Uh, and this qualifies ent entirely what, uh, what a particle is at a fundamental level. Now, uh, when we look at the possibilities and the range, the landscape of values for the mass of the dark matter, we're looking at an immense uh, landscape. And in fact, the landscape is intrinsically bounded by two considerations. Number one, uh, the dark matter wavelength, the de Broglie wavelength of the dark matter as a particle cannot exceed the size of the smallest dark matter collapsed structures. And the reason is very simple. If the Debrey wavelength uh, exceeded the size of collapsed structures, uh, this would lead to a suppression of the matter over densities by quantum pressure. And the dark matter could not actually gravitationally clump uh, on those scales. Uh, this, uh, in turn, sets a lower limit, an absolute lower limit to the dark matter, even if the spin J is an integer, and so we have no Fermi Pauli blocking effects, uh, to roughly 10 to the negative 22 electron volts. On the other side of this large landscape, um, one has the opposite effect, which is a tidal disruption of structures, structures that are observed uh, uh, to be very long-lived, such as global clusters or disks of galaxies, which are undisturbed by the passage 
of uh, potentially very massive uh, dark matter particles. And, and actually in the, in the book that Dr. Gosh was mentioning, uh, there is uh, a derivation of what the bound is on this, uh, uh, from this effect. And the bound is a few solar masses. In fact, uh, the state of the art in this context is a recent study that I carried out with, with my collaborators, where we look exactly at the most promising system, which is the Eridanus II dwarf galaxy, uh, a nearby uh, dwarf galaxy discovered by the Dark Energy Survey collaboration. Uh, and uh, uh, so if, if you want to quote exactly what the upper limit on dark matter uh, uh, from microscopic gravitational tidal effects, please refer to this, uh, to this work. So, uh, Stefano, I have a question. Yes. So this please. bound is dependent on the spin also? Very good. So uh, the lower bound depends on the spin. Uh, if you consider fermions, uh, Fermi degeneracy pressure bounds the dark matter mass to roughly a kilo electron volt. So in this region here, a thousand electron volts. Uh, in the large limit, uh, the spin is, influ is not influential. Okay. So if you think about rotating black holes, uh, yeah. there is no difference from the dynamical perspective because it only depends on mass. Thank you for the question, Sayanta. Very good. In this vast landscape, there is a special point. And a special point has to do with a mass scale called the Planck mass, which is essentially the gravitational constant, Newton's gravitational constant in natural units. Uh, now, what happens at the Planck scale is the following. If you calculate the Schwarzschild radius and you express the Schwarzschild radius in terms of the Planck scale, you realize that the Schwarzschild radius corresponding to the Planck scale is precisely the Compton wavelength of uh, uh, the dark matter at that scale. So in other words, what happens at the Planck scale is you transition from a regime where the dark matter behaves as a particle to a regime where the dark matter behaves as a macroscopic object where gravitational effects are larger than quantum effects. Uh, and for all intent and purposes, uh, in the limit in which one considers candidates much more massive than a Planck scale, which is what we're going to do today, uh, one should not consider a, a particle picture, but rather a, uh, a classical general relativity black hole picture or a macroscopic picture. Now, interestingly, as, uh, as uh, we all know, uh, the physics of black holes uh, ultimately resembles the physics at a fundamental level of particles in the sense that a black hole uh, is uh, uh, largely labeled exactly in the same way that a particle is uh, for very different reasons. Uh, so a black hole essentially depends only on its mass and on its angular momentum, uh, which is not quantized in the case of black holes uh, for, for what we know, um, and potentially on the charges uh, of the black holes, which uh, will actually play a role later in my talk. Uh, so today I will focus on the right-hand side of this landscape of possibilities uh, for what the dark matter is. And within this landscape, which again is bounded on the one hand by the Planck scale, and on the other hand, uh, again, because of tidal disruption effects, uh, by a mass that is in the few stellar mass uh, range, I will discuss black holes that are at or slightly below a stellar mass. I will then transition to a very interesting class of candidates, uh, uh, which are black holes with a mass uh, roughly corresponding to an asteroid mass. Uh, this is 13 orders of magnitude less uh, than a star. Uh, or about a million times lighter than a planet like Earth. Uh, I will then talk about much smaller objects. These are pyramid mass black holes. Uh, and, and these objects are interesting because uh, we will see that Hawking evaporation uh, suggests that these pyramid mass black holes are, in the words of Hawking, exploding right now. Uh, so they are evaporating as we speak. 
if they form the early universe. Uh, I will then talk about black holes that are so light that have actually already disappeared if they were produced in the early universe. And finally, I will talk about what I call grain of salt black holes. These are objects that are right around the Planck scale. The Planck scale is a macroscopic scale. If you think about a grain of salt, a grain of salt roughly has the same mass as the Planck scale. So, uh, so I like to indicate, uh, yes, so please say that. Uh, maybe it is a very bad question to ask, but I really don't know what, what do you mean by pyramid mass means, what is the significance of the name? Uh, there's no significance. It's to sort of get a um, an idea of the size of the mass of such a black hole. Okay. Uh, uh, right. Maybe, so, maybe it's ma massive black hole. So some terminology you were using for... Right, right, right. So we, we roughly have an idea of what a ton is. A ton is a cubic meter of water. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, what is 10 to the 16? Well, you can think of 10 to the 16 as 10 million cubic meters of water. I don't really visualize that. Uh, okay. But a pyramid corresponds exactly to that mass, okay. or roughly okay. to that so mass. That corresponds. Yeah. Very good. Um, now, let me preface that if black holes are a significant fraction of the dark matter, they cannot be of stellar origin, just because, of course, stars form from baryonic matter. And we know uh, that the dark matter far exceeds, uh, in its cosmological abundance, uh, baryonic matter. So since stars are a small fraction of something that is a small fraction of the total matter of the universe, they cannot be of stellar origin. In fact, these days we know that uh, stellar mass black holes are a quarter of 1% of the cold dark matter. They essentially behave at late times as cold dark matter. They gravitate and, and they, for all intent and purposes, are non-interacting, slow moving, uh, and therefore essentially dust, just like the dark matter, but they're a very, very tiny fraction. There's of course a second class of black holes, supermassive black holes, and again, uh, we have these days a pretty accurate idea of what the total mass of supermassive black holes is in the universe. And that is a really tiny fraction. Uh, it's 0.002% of the cold dark matter today. Now, so please. I, I have one more question. So please. if you tell me, I can ask. So here uh, you were talking about stellar mass black holes and supermassive black holes, and you were trying to show the... Uh, mass function, how it behaves. Correct. So Correct. For this mass function, I'm asking, are you uh, have chosen any specific profile or because uh, like in this type of dark matter, we talked about sometimes like press sector formalism, some very good. Yeah. Very good. So, yeah. so so the mass function that is adopted here has to do with a number of processes that lead to star formation. So uh, Sayantan, it, it is uh, something that, that is happening in the universe much later than structure formation a la press tractor. So, you know, all the bumps that you observe here correspond to stars uh, of different generations that collapse at different times. Uh, and so you can see here, these are the remnants of massive supernova events that produce black holes in the hundreds of solar masses. These are stars that probably weigh just a few solar masses, and these are stars that weigh around uh, 10 solar masses or so. So different stellar population that collapse, giving rise to black holes, contribute at different redshifts, as you can see here, this is a redshift dependence, to the total amount of mass in stellar mass black holes on this side and supermassive black holes on this other side. Now, supermassive black holes uh, formation is, at the moment, essentially an open question. Um, and uh, and I'll get to this. Uh, but let me just throw out there uh, an interesting consideration. I claim the supermassive black holes cannot are not a significant portion of the dark matter. However, if one is interested in the entropy budget of the universe, one can go ahead and calculate the entropy associated with all the species that populate the universe. Think about the CMB, think about the cosmological neutrino background, think about backgrounds of gravitational waves, uh, planets, stars, gas, 
Uh, well, the largest contributors to the entropy budget of the universe, as it turns out, is in supermassive black holes. And the reason essentially is that entropy scales with the square of the mass. And so supermassive black holes are disproportionately large contributors to this. Uh, also, we now have evidence that supermassive black holes may form at very early times. And uh, it, it is complicated to understand how this formation happens uh, from the collapse of early population three massive stars. In fact, it's unclear whether that's a possibility at all. Uh, and other mechanisms have been proposed that have to do with dark matter, such as direct collapse of metal-free large clumps of gas triggered by dark matter decay, uh, or by black hole evaporation from uh, light primordial black holes that may evaporate just in time to help cool these clumps of gas into uh, supermassive black holes. And the last possibility that I'm especially interested in and I'm working on is the gravel thermal collapse of the course of very strong interacting dark matter halos. And here Sianta, in fact, uh, the name of the game is the press tractor formalism. So we form these supermassive black holes in the early universe because the cores of early structures may contain a subcomponent of strongly interacting dark matter that could gravel thermally collapse, so cool very efficiently and collapse into a black hole at early times. Uh, so please ask me about any of this uh, if you're interested uh, after the talk. So, Stefano, it would be good if you can sh able to share some of the references. Um, you yeah. can see the references here oh, yeah, uh, in the yeah, lower yeah. right. Here it is written, yeah. Okay. Very good. Okay, sure. So what this talk will not be about, and I apologize for that. Uh, of course, I cannot talk about everything uh, in, within an hour or an hour and a half, uh, is how these non-stellar black holes uh, form. Uh, and you know the reason is that there's a large landscape of possibilities. Uh, the most obvious one is that uh, there may be, uh, because of inflation, uh, large density perturbations on very small scales that lead to the collapse of uh, portions of the universe at very early times, giving rise to black holes. Uh, a second interesting possibility is that uh, there exists a phase transition where pressure is strongly reduced, uh, such as the QCD phase transition, and upon reduction of pressure, the collapse of density perturbations may take place even in the late universe uh, at the moment when the phase transition happens. Other possibilities include uh, the collapse of the interception of cosmic strings loops, which again lead to large density perturbations, bubble collisions, if you have a phase transition in the early universe that is strongly first order and then proceeds through bubble nucleation. At the boundaries of these bubbles, you've got very large density contrast and, and the boundaries can collapse into black holes. Uh, myself and my collaborators have explored the possibility that you have a dark sector where dark stars form and can collapse into black holes of a variety of masses. Uh, again, in the context of phase transitions, you can trap fermions uh, into islands of unbroken phase and collapse them into black holes. And again, something that I'm actively working on is the gravel thermal collapse of self-interacting dark matter cores. So I will not talk about this because there's a number of ways to form black holes, both in the early and in the late universe. Now in this business, uh, uh, there was a stark change of people's views of uh, black holes of non-stellar origin as dark matter candidates. It's fair to say that uh, prior to roughly 2019, uh, people had in mind pictures like this. Uh, what this is, is the fraction of the dark matter that can consist of black holes of non-stellar origin. Uh, so primordial black holes divided by dark matter in abundance as a function of the mass of the primordial black holes, assuming that all the black holes have the same mass. Uh, anything that is above these uh, lines was considered to be excluded. Uh, and so you would say, well, I never get to one, and therefore uh, these black holes cannot be the dark matter. Well, the situation has tremendously changed. 
And today we know that there is a landscape of masses uh, in the asteroid mass range uh, that can be 100% of the dark matter. Uh, and elsewhere, the constraints that used to be considered as firm have actually shifted a lot. Now we know that, for instance, stellar mass black holes at most can be on the order of 1% or so. Uh, planetary mass black holes can be at most 1% and so on. So uh, again, asteroid mass primordial black holes can be 100% of the dark matter and Earth mass and above can only be about one to 10% of the dark matter. Now, let me start this uh, trip across uh, uh, the landscape of masses of primordial black holes is dark matter uh, with the most massive possible black holes, which again are slightly below uh, one solar mass. Now in the business of dark matter, it is of tremendous importance uh, to understand whether uh, you can pinpoint an unmistakable signature, an unmistakable experimental or observational signature that tells you that what you're observing is uh, a dark matter phenomenon and not an astrophysical uh, or experimental artifact. And so the question is, uh, are there clean signatures of primordial black holes of sub stellar mass that are clear cut? And the answer is yes. The answer is yes, because if we were to observe with gravitational waves, a black hole merger with a mass of uh, one of the two merging black holes below a, uh, the mass corresponding to the Chandrasekhar mass, which is uh, the mass below which one would form yeah. neutron stars as opposed to black holes, then we would have a smoking gun signature of the existence of exotic black holes of non-stellar origin. Now, what we did with my collaborators was to calculate how many such events one can expect by essentially studying the parameter space of, again, how much the black holes contribute to the dark matter in the universe and how many of these black holes are light enough to be below the Chandrasekhar mass, but massive enough to be detectable by LIGO. And the rates are actually quite significant, even if uh, one only assumes the black holes are a few percent of uh, the dark matter. And so this is quite interesting. And in fact, it's interesting enough that uh, the gravitational wave experiments are actively searching for this. Yes. There is a question. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so I'm just asking, sir, uh, like, why like you choose the Chandrasekhar limit? I mean, not the neutron star limits at 3.5, like the mostly like the Kolmana Banana Volkov limit. Like, I mean, just asking because it could be very well the neutron star, right? I mean, it could be pushed without the limit. Yeah, technically, technically the TOV limit uh, would be more appropriate in this context. So thank you for the question. Um, by assuming uh, the Chandrasekhar limit, I am just being more conservative, right? Uh, so I am, I'm just enforcing that uh, these black holes be definitely very, very light. Um, uh, and, um, and so, you know, uh, it is consistent with the TOV limit as well. Yeah, now. Yes. Uh, now these searches are ongoing, and in fact, uh, one candidate event already exists. Uh, was detected in 2017. This is not my work; it's the work of Gonzalo Moras and uh, collaborators uh, that showed that uh, there is a pretty high likelihood that in this event, one of the two participating objects is a sub-solar mass black holes with, uh, as they calculated, 84% of the posterior probability. Uh, so one of the, of the objects would be more massive than 2.2 uh, solar masses, but one would be below one solar mass. And so if these are, in fact, uh, uh, black hole, black hole mergers, uh, this uh, would be uh, a smoking gun of uh, one of the two objects not being an neutron star. And so this, again, would be a smoking gun for uh, a non-astrophysical formed black hole. Now, you may notice as a joke that uh, uh, this paper uh, appeared on April 1st. Uh, and so hopefully, it's not an April's full joke. 
Now, let me talk a little bit about asteroid mass black holes. Uh, again, what I have in mind here uh, are objects that are massive enough that you can actually see the lensing effect of stars produced by these objects. However, this phenomenon called microlensing that I'm about to describe turns out to be a lot trickier than previously thought. Uh, and interestingly, we realize that there is a large and irreducible background uh, to microlensing searches for primordial black holes that comes from so-called rogue planets. And so let me talk about these two issues. So as I explained, this plot is incorrect. And in particular is incorrect in this region where uh, this entire blue area is ruled out uh, or was claimed to be ruled out by a seven hour long observation of our twin galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy, also known as M31, with uh, the Japanese uh, telescope uh, Subaru Hyper Supreme camera uh, in Chile. So this seven hour long observation stared at about a million stars, uh, resolving a million stars in Andromeda, a fantastic angular resolution. Uh, and with three collaborators, uh, one of whom is an expert on uh, the Andromeda galaxy and its star population, another one of whom is uh, an expert on uh, observation and finite size source effects, we studied uh, what exactly the stars observed uh, in the Andromeda galaxy looked like. Now, the constraints that I was showing here in blue assumed that all of the stars in Andromeda are the size in the sky of the sun. However, that's completely incorrect. And in fact, stars like the sun are invisible to the Hyper Supreme camera. Uh, and what we did was to account in detail for the stellar population of uh, stars in Andromeda, which is represented here as the relative abundance of stars as a function of radius in stellar radii. And so as you can see, uh, stars like the sun form less than 1% of the stars visible to HSC. And in fact, the typical size of stars that are visible by HSC is about 100 times larger than the sun. What does this mean for microlensing? Well, the bigger the star, the more important finite size source effects are. What am I talking about? So imagine that you're observing a star with your telescope. Uh, and you see light from the star. Now, microlensing works in the following way. You have an intervening mass. Uh, the light through gravity, well-known gravitational wave effects is bent. And therefore, you collect more light as the black hole transits. And you see a blip in the luminosity of the star that depends on the transit time and on the mass of uh, the black holes, among other things. Now, if the star is very large in the sky, in fact, it's larger than the typical size of uh, the lensing effect, which is known as the Einstein radius uh, of the black hole, then obviously the effect is reduced because the lensing uh, happens on light that would anyway get to you, right? The light from here is coming to you anyways, whether or not is bent by the black hole. Now, this is a simple picture. But in fact, if you put in all of the details and you consider a source of size theta s and a lens of angular size theta e, uh, the magnification as a function of time is highly suppressed. If you consider, I hear, I hear a lot of background talking, uh, is highly suppressed here by factors of a few uh, with respect to the assumption that the lens be uh, point-like. What does this mean? Well, this means that the constraints are weaker because the magnification amplitude is weaker. And in fact, by considering all stars to be four, six, eight, or 11 times uh, the size of the sun in the sky, these constraints shrink by orders of magnitude to the right, so towards more massive black holes uh, that cause uh, a larger amplification of the um, uh, star itself. And so the all constraints uh, are a large overestimation with respect to the actual constraints that we are calculated here. 
And notice that there is a little bit of an error that comes for uncertainty on the stellar population. Now, in addition to this, which of course has the big implication that all of these masses are unconstrained, uh, there's a similar issue that pertains uh, to the so-called femtolensing that is essentially the same effect, but at much, much smaller wavelengths or higher frequency. Uh, and so Katz and company have pointed out in 2018, this is not my work, the femtolensing is also not ruling out masses in the asteroid mass range. So in fact, the notion that this mass range, asteroid mass range is now completely allowed is taken seriously even by string theorists. Uh, people like Matthew Kleban uh, is writing papers where in the abstract, they claim that in fact, this mass range is compatible with black holes being 100% of the dark matter. So if, if it's string theory is saying this, it has to be correct. Of course, I'm joking. Uh, now, microlensing events have, in oh, fact, uh, been detected. Uh, Stefano, I have a question. Please, please so, say, Anton. Is it good to have a monochromatic primordial black holes? Ah, very good question. So uh, all of these constraints are traditionally shown as uh, uh, under the assumption that the mass function of the black holes is monochromatic. That is unphysical, right? Because black holes will have formed in the early universe through mechanisms that don't select exclusively one mass. Uh, now, what this means is that if you have your own favorite mass function, these constraints would change. Uh, but the interesting thing is that they would change in ways that are very easy to calculate uh, once you know the constraints for monochromatic mass functions. And the reason is that monochromatic mass functions are delta functions. So imagine that you have a mass function psi. Now to calculate the constraints for that mass function, all you need to do is taking the integral of psi divided by these constraints and integrating mass uh, and set that equal to one. And that gives you the constraint of the normalization of the mass function. So in other words, once you have the monochromatic constraints, you have a delta function, which makes it very easy to carry out integrals and generalize to whatever mass function you want. Now, these microlensing events may very well be primordial black holes. However, uh, we know that there's other stuff in the galaxy, in our own galaxy, as well as in uh, Andromeda, that would produce exactly the same type events. Uh, and this stuff is planets that are freely floating uh, away from stars uh, and that for all intents and purposes would produce the same exact microlensing events as uh, primordial black holes of comparable mass. So the good news is that NASA is about to send in space probably three years or so, uh, a telescope, the Nancy Grace Roman telescope, that uh, is going to be the perfect tool to detect hundreds of these freely floating planets. Again, planets that have been ejected from their parent star in the early phases of uh, planetary systems uh, formation. Now, freely floating planets are therefore an irreducible background to searches for PBH in their mass range where they can be 100% of the dark matter and vice versa. PBHs are a background in principle to freely floating planets. So the key question is, will this new tool, the Roman telescope, enable observers to disentangle freely floating planets from a situation where you have a combination of primordial black holes and freely floating planets? And so with a team in my research group, we set out to study whether that will be possible in the most conservative uh, possible approach, which is just by studying the statistics of the event duration. Now, what that means is that we count how many events there are of a given duration with the intent of then associating the duration with the mass and therefore the mass function of uh, uh, the two populations. Notice that this is very conservative in the sense that there are other handles that may or may not, with Roman's capabilities, help us disentangle the presence of an additional population to freely floating planets. These are, in fact, finite size source effects that are different uh, for FFPs and PBH, follow-up observations, the location in the sky. Uh, 
Notice that we produce the code that is available on GitHub that allows to compute statistics uh, for Roman and other telescopes uh, very efficiently uh, for microlensing events. Now, what does the statistics look like? So again, we are showing the number of events as a function of the duration. Uh, the yellow histogram represents the general expectation for 3D floating planets, assuming a certain abundance and mass function, uh, while the blue histogram refers to a population of black holes that is not even the entirety of the dark matter. In this case, it's a massive population with a large fraction of it being responsible for the dark matter. While here, we have a population that is less massive uh, and has less of an abundance in terms of the dark matter density. Uh, so sort of by eye, one can tell that in this case, uh, there are statistical grounds by which one can distinguish the yellow from the blue population. Well, here you cannot, right? The blue just looks like uh, uh, and enhance the more populous FFP population. So you can turn this type of statistical test into a systematic study uh, as a function of the, the abundance of 3D plotting planets, which is not known, uh, of the Roman sensitivity. And, and what this plot shows is that Roman uh, constraints and sensitivity will go all the way to an abundance of, uh, of PBH that is extremely small, in fact, of the order of 0.01% of the dark matter. And even more interestingly, Roman will have the statistical ability to probe the events that have already been observed and to distinguish only based on statistics, FFPs from PBH. So stay tuned. Again, the telescope will launch in 2027. And I think it's going to be very, very interesting in trying to look for PBH with microlensing. Now, going back to Sayantan's pyramids, uh, which again, is just a proxy for PBH of mass 10 to the 16 grams. These guys are, in the words of Hawking, exploding black holes. What do I mean by that? Well, as you may know, a field theory that is defined on a black hole background uh, is actually in a thermal state for an asymptotic observer uh, with a temperature that is given by the Planck scale square divided by the black hole mass. As a result, if you think back at your intro physics, any body that has a temperature T radiates according to the Stefan Boltzmann law which says that the amount of energy radiated, the amount of mass that is shed by a black body is proportional to the areas, to the surface area of the body times the fourth power of the temperature. Now, if you substitute this expression for the temperature, you realize that black holes shed mass uh, proportionally to one over mass squared. Now, this is pretty interesting because the uh, black hole evaporation is therefore a runaway effect, meaning that the smaller the mass, the quicker the evaporation. There is a typo in this formula. It should be time and not temperature. Uh, while massive black holes evaporate very, very slowly and have a very, very low temperature. Uh, if you look at the lifetime resulting from the process of Hawking evaporation and the shedding of mass of a black hole, you will find that for a mass uh, at about five times 10 to the 14 grams, so slightly smaller than a pyramid, uh, the temperature is about 100 MeV and the black holes are expiring, are exploding today. Uh, for lower masses, black holes have already exploded and the evaporation products uh, may lead to particles that are detectable in the late universe by our instruments. Uh, and this can be used to constrain the fraction of light per model black holes that can be the dark matter. For instance, uh, black hole evaporation produces photons. It produces photons directly by prompt evaporation into photons, uh, but more importantly, it produces photons because other particles that result from black hole evaporation eventually decay into photons or radiate photons. So what we did with my collaborators was to correct previous calculations of uh, the emission rate 
of black holes with masses of interest to constraints uh, to the black hole abundance. And we realized that because of a number of technical reasons that have to do with chiral perturbation theory, vector mass and dominance, electronic form factors, uh, the previous calculations were incorrect. And so we put together a code called HASMA that does this properly. Uh, and what is most interesting to me is that there is a telescope down the road called Gecko that NASA is considering that will be able to detect photons in exactly the right uh, energy range. Now, with my actually Indian collaborator, Murad Korvar, who's now a postdoc here in the Bay Area, we obtained the strongest constraints to date from black hole evaporations in the early universe, which uh, are related to a diffuse gamma ray emission as observed by an ancient MEV telescope, uh, the Comtel telescope, uh, as well as from uh, Integral SPI, which was another uh, telescope uh, launched by NASA decades ago that observed the 511 keV line from positron electron annihilation. Uh, and in this business, there were a bunch of uh, incorrect results. Our results, which are shown here in this most constraining line, the purple dashed line, uh, that line extended by significant amounts the limits on the abundance of black holes in the pyramid mass range. Uh, and I invite you, and, and I invite you uh, to use this constraint if you think about black holes evaporating in the early universe. Now, if stuff has evaporated at very early times, what happens is these constraints no longer apply because the particles produced in the early universe are thermalized with stuff, with the plasma of the early universe, and therefore do not contribute to observations today. However, there's one species that will survive because it never thermalizes below the Planck scale, and that's gravity waves. Uh, and again, if you know, uh, if you are curious about these gravity waves, and the way in which they can be detected, which is actually with axion search experiments, such as ADMX, please again, ask me. We've been very active and actually we have a working group within ADMX looking for these very high frequency gravitational waves potentially produced in the early universe. Not gravity. Yes. Please uh, repeat the question. No, it's a gravitational waves, not gravity waves. Gravity waves is something like we have in our atmosphere. <laughs> Remember. <laughs> Sorry. Very good. Gravitational waves. Sorry. Thank you. But what if black holes are about to explode now? Uh, and how can we search for black holes that are currently in the process of exploding? Well, the good news is that any black hole has essentially the exact same light curve. And what I mean by that is that the emission, for instance, of photons as a function of the remaining lifetime of black holes is universal. Uh, and is shown here uh, as a function of, again, the expiration time uh, by this dashed line. Now, what that means is that black holes are perfect standard candles. Uh, they all look exactly the same, no matter which mass they started with. Uh, and they actually look like backwards gamma ray bursts, meaning that their luminosity and their energy increases uh, as a function of time tremendously. Uh, notice that black holes also uh, have no afterglow at all. In other words, uh, they, the products of black hole evaporations cannot thermalize and so do not form a photosphere or a chromosphere. So they don't thermalize neither in QED nor in QCD type processes. And therefore these GRBs, uh, these, these uh, black holes look like GRBs, but they have no afterglow. Uh, notice that we have two curves here. And the second curve assumes that you have additional degrees of freedom. Now this plot was done when supersymmetry was popular. And so if you think about supersymmetry, uh, you're gonna have a bunch of additional degrees of freedom kick in uh, at some point at the supersymmetry breaking scale, and then evaporation happens earlier than uh, it would in the absence of these additional degrees of freedom because the black hole has more particles to evaporate into. Now, this is interesting because black hole evaporating uh, today are actually a probe of 
the number of degrees of freedom in a dark sector. So if you look at these curves, they represent the time to explosion for uh, a different number of additional degrees of freedom. And again, what I'm looking at here is the differential number of photons as a function of time. Uh, and so adding degrees of freedom at a given mass, here I'm choosing 10 to the negative one or 10 to the five GeV, uh, tremendously affects the shape of the final photon burst uh, that we are slated to or potentially able to observe. Now, how can you search for these explosions today? Well, uh, this will depend on two things. One is where these events are, so the distance to the evaporating black hole. And number two, what the mass of the evaporating black hole is in the moment in which we detect it. Uh, so of course, the black hole has to have some mass if you're seeing its evaporation. And the x-axis here shows what the mass is. And again, black holes in the 10 to the 14 range are black holes evaporating today. Uh, so these different lines that I will explain later correspond to different observatories, some at very, very high energy, some at very, very low energy, observing gamma rays. Now let's look at this plot in, uh, in depth and try to convert the black hole mass into the remaining lifetime. So the expression that we saw before relates the lifetime to the black hole mass, uh, again, because of this one over m squared factor, and as you can see, black holes in the ton mass range evaporate very quickly. So if we are to detect a black hole with a mass of 10 to the nine grams, we're only able to observe it for a fraction of a second. If the black hole that we observe has a mass of 10 to the 11 grams, that evaporation lasts five days. Uh, and if we go up one order of magnitude, it lasts actually several years. And it just takes a little over two orders of magnitude for black hole evaporation to then take the entire age of the universe. We can still potentially see these evaporating black holes directly if they are close enough to us. Now, another way to look at this plot is to think about the temperature of the black holes because black holes essentially radiate as black bodies and therefore the temperature, which again depends inversely on the mass of the black hole, tells us at which typical energy the emission products are. So at these very, very light masses, we're looking at multi-TeV photons. Uh, in this range, 100 GeV. In this range, MeV, as we explained before. And in this more massive range, in the MeV. Now, let me go back to, uh, to this plot and discuss the different reasons why these curves have the shape they have. So first of all, the distance correlates with the size of the detectors. As long as you see something, as long as you see some photons. Uh, so for instance, CTA is a much bigger detector than a gamma ray burst monitor. And that entails that the distance is over a hundred times larger to which CTA is sensitive to. But in this range here, you're limited by the number of photons that you can possibly detect over a very short range of time. In the second patch, you're limited by how long you're observing the evaporation for. Uh, and that in turn depends on the observatory and how long the observatory has to observe a given event. Finally, in the large mass limit, the black hole temperature collides with the energy range that the detector is sensitive to. For instance, CTA is actually not sensitive to uh, MeV gamma rays, and even the LAT uh, telescope is not sensitive to a fraction of uh, a GeV or so uh, gamma rays, and therefore the sensitivity drops uh, quite steadily. But again, we have a chance at observing some of these events. Uh, now notice that the longer the observation time, the larger the proper motion of the source of gamma rays should be in the sky. And so for instance, for a black hole that is 10 to the negative three parsecs away, we expect a proper motion on the order of 10 degrees. And just for reference, the moon is a one degree size object in the sky. So these are very, very large movements in the sky that pretty much any of these telescopes would be able to detect. 
So we have a hope at detecting these exploding black holes. Where should we look for them? Well, the best bet that one has is to use uh, gamma ray burst catalogs as obtained by the Fermi Large Area Telescope and by the Fermi Gamma Ray Burst Monitor. And there's a few uh, things that one can use. And unfortunately, I'm running out of time. I'm very happy to comment on this. But essentially, the handles one has are the light curve, so the shape of the flux of photons is a function of time, the absolute brightness of the black hole, the spectrum that is produced, which again, now we can calculate uh, very accurately, and the sky distribution of these events. And we've done all of this, and we have actually identified a few candidate events in the LAT gamma ray uh, burst catalog. These are all the candidate events that we've seen. Uh, notice that they're supposed to be very, very close by. Uh, in fact, this distance here, 10 to the negative five parsecs, is essentially one astronomical unit. So these are exploding black holes that are supposed to be within uh, the solar system. And now that's very unlikely if the black hole mass is in this range. Uh, unfortunately, none of the sources that we've identified exhibit any proper motion. And this is inconsistent with the fact that these nearby sources should really exhibit uh, over long enough periods of time, significant proper motion. So the conclusion is that unfortunately, even if there are some events that do look like evaporating black holes in the GRB catalog of Fermilat, uh, these sources are most likely not evaporating black holes. Now there is uh, uh, a sort of good news, which is we are currently working on a different way to identify nearby bright gamma ray burst-like events, which is using the so-called interplanetary GRB network or IPN. Uh, this is a set of uh, tens of spacecrafts that carry small payloads able to measure gamma ray bursts. And by using the timing resolution of these uh, spacecrafts in detecting GRBs, we would actually be able to discriminate a nearby event from an event that is at cosmological distances. So we are sorting through the IPN catalog of GRBs and try to find whether any candidates is present there uh, and results are forthcoming. Now, of course, detecting Hawking radiation would be momentous. Uh, as I explained, it would give us an opportunity to detect dark sectors. And there are in principle a number of handles to astronomically discriminate GRBs from exploding black holes. As I said, I'm running out of time. Uh, but I do want to mention that ton-sized black hole explosions actually can be very interesting for cosmology. Uh, we've shown, for instance, that the evaporation of black holes in the early universe can lead to both the production of dark matter and the baryon asymmetry. We've shown that there could exist operators that would source a baryon asymmetry directly uh, uh, by coupling the Kreshman scalar associated with the metric of the black hole to the B minus L current. And finally, uh, black holes exploding in the early universe, as I alluded to, could produce gravitational waves uh, that are at high frequency and that in principle are detectable with experiments uh, looking for, for instance, axions. Now, finally, let me tell you about this grade of salt black holes. Yes, please. Yeah. So you have said that uh, you have coupled with Krishman scalar. So usually Krishman scalar is a very important quantity for singularities. So once you couple with uh, this type of baryon uh, asymmetry uh, kind of thing, so is it going to affect any sort of singularities or something like that for that? So in the context uh, of this work, uh, what we uh, needed was a time-dependent uh, object associated with the metric of a black hole. And as you know, the Ricci scalar uh, is not time-dependent. In fact, um, uh, you know, it's time derivative vanishes uh, for genetic black holes. Uh, but the Kreshman scalar has a non-vanishing time derivative. And so that is what, what triggers the necessary uh, uh, coupling to the B minus set current in a time dependent way that can produce a baryon asymmetry. Now, what happens once evaporation terminates, 
uh, and a singularity, uh, 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 you know, arises uh, is irrelevant to this scenario. So I, I'm not able to comment on how this scenario would relate to the Kreshman scalar associated with singularities. Now, grain of cell black holes are interesting because they're the terminal state of an evaporated black hole. And in its terminal state, it's been pointed out, the black holes should be charged. They should be charged because the evaporation into charged and non-charged species uh, is in fact not necessarily the same. And because of Poissonian statistics, you will end up with a relic charge when evaporation stops. And when does evaporation stop? Well, we don't know. Uh, it could stop because the charge of the black hole shrinks the event horizon. As you well know, uh, uh, the event horizon of a charged black hole is reduced with respect to a neutral black hole uh, or because of quantum gravity effects. In any case, it is possible that uh, black holes carry a charge. And so instead of PBH, we can consider the fraction of the black holes that carry an electric charge near the Planck scale. And as it turns out, the best way to detect these objects is with direct detection apparatuses, such as Sina and Lanton, neutrino telescopes, but the best bet is actually paleo detectors. These are essentially crystals with a very, very regular uh, crystal structure that do not exhibit defects at all. Uh, and these are very ancient crystals that formed giga years times ago. Uh, and therefore that you have a very, very long exposure times. And even if, these crystals are very small. So let's say a millimeter squared in surface area, you're able to set very, very important constraints on the fraction of Planck scale relics that are charged. So let me stop here and let me just wrap this up uh, uh, with a few take home messages. Stellar mass black holes, uh, again, the sub TOV or sub, sub Chandra Sekar mass uh, would be a smoking gun for black holes of non-stellar origin. Searches are ongoing, and perhaps there's even evidence for one event already uh, in the LIGO data. Uh, asteroid mass black holes can be 100% of the dark matter. Uh, microlensing is trickier than previously thought because of finite size source effects. Uh, and even if we detected one uh, of these microlensing events, there would be a background to consider rogue planets. Uh, however, the Roman telescope will collect such a large statistic that exclusively based on that, we would be able to distinguish rogue planets from PBHs. What if PBHs explode? Uh, well, the best constraints come from diffuse gamma rays, uh, and it's pretty exciting that future MEB telescopes will have a chance to detect this uh, early universe of operation of primordial black holes. Uh, black hole explosions are also observable. They look like reverse GRBs. We've looked for them, we have not found them. Uh, and finally, black holes evaporating in the universe can be responsible for a number of interesting things, such as dark matter, the binary symmetry of the universe, and gravitational waves. And finally, at the terminal point of black hole evaporations, black holes should be uh, charged, or at least some of them should be charged and they are detectable if they are charged. Uh, and the best bet to detect them is uh, to use paleo detectors of very ancient crystals. So to conclude, in the era of gravitational wave astronomy, the physics of macroscopic dark matter candidates, such as black holes, offers, in my opinion, many opportunities for the ingenuity of theorists, as well as for the craft of observers. And I will stop here. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Stefano, uh, uh, for, <coughs> for, for this nice talk. Uh, uh, I would request everyone to give a clap for him, for giving such a nice talk. Thank you. <laughs> uh, OK, so maybe there are a few questions uh, and comments by students. So please, please unmute and ask the question. Nitartu, you please ask, because you have written something in the chat box. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Uh, Stefano, for such a wonderful talk. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Okay. 
so uh, i was asking can you just go back to the slide where you were showing about the uh, plan the evaporation on the plankian scales certainly uh, i think a couple of slides before the end one ah very good sorry <laughs> So you're looking at this? Uh, yes, yes, exactly. So here you have said that the ev if evaporation stops around the Planck scale, so that means we are assuming that if it stops around the Planck scale, so we are left with a charged Planck scale relic. But what happens Correct. if, I mean, I do not know, but what happens if it continues beyond the Planck scale? Like if you go to the Trans-Planckian scale, can the evaporation con uh, happen in there? Or, I mean. Very good. So, uh, So the answer is we don't know. Uh, and, you know, being conservatives here, um, I, I put a constraint, which is solid, which is extremality, right? So if you have a charge of one, if you have the minimal charge, uh, black holes with a sub-Planckian, or as you said, trans-Planckian, this usually trans-Planckian means beyond the, trans, uh, the, the Planck scale, sub-Planckian black holes, are a possibility as shown here up until when they become extremal. So they don't have uh, any horizon anymore. Uh, and, uh, you know, extremal black holes are considered to be unphysical. And so I would say that going below 0.09 or so of the Planck scale is very hard without invoking very exotic new physics. Does that make sense? Oh, yes, yes. Very good. And Sayantan, I see your hand, please. Yeah, Sayantan. Yeah, uh, so thank you very much for this amazing talk. So I have basically one question. So uh, because, I mean, I read your book, so I was honored. So in the, if we take from the particle point, we can import the, both the sites. So we can actually probe the site from the channeling, various scattering cross-section, as well as the cosmic rays and the charges. Here, I mean, like the, First problem is that theoretically, as you said, that we do not know the details of the primordial black holes, like the cosmic spin, as well as the observation, it seems the EM1. So, like I'm asking that if you detect the even the Hawking radiation, etc., what could be the smoking gun? I mean, it could be very well that a CMB anomaly or like the some AGN anomaly, right? So I'm asking that how confident we would be on the uh, Hawking radiation because the CMB already washes up a a uh, 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 large chunk of the Hawking radiation, right? So that would be my first question. Excellent, excellent question. Thank you, Sayantan. Uh, let me go to the relevant slide here, uh, which is this one. And uh, let me go back to sharing. Right. So the name of the game is doing this exercise correctly, which is what we attempted to do. Uh, so please notice that these uh, black holes are slated to evaporate uh, in the uh, early universe, as you said, uh, but, you know, they, they are evaporating today as well, right? So even if this mass exceeds uh, the mass of um, uh, black holes that have completely evaporated in the early universe. These events are actually late universe evaporations. Okay, so there's no issue of transparency. Uh, in other words, uh, what I said about, um, about black holes that evaporate in the early universe and the products thermalizing does not apply if the lifetime of black hole uh, is close to the age of the universe. And so for instance, in this case, the lifetime is about a million times or so, uh, the age of the universe, but you still have some decays, right? You have the tail of the decay distribution. And so in the late universe, these photons are emitted and they come to us straight, right? They come to us just because if this is in fact the dark matter, uh, it will in part decay. Uh, now, the second part of your question has to do with how would we be able to detect this over a background? Uh, and well, the way in which uh, we would be able to detect it is a combination of using the spectrum of the emission, which is very unique because it has a Bremsstrahlung tail visible here and uh, a peak that results from prompt evaporation in addition to prompt production of pions 
that results, neutral pi ions always decay into two protons, that results in this typical bump structure. Uh, and so the combination of a spectral feature that is stunning and very visible and recognizable, and the fact that this emission should correlate with the density of dark matter. So say, Anton, you're familiar, I'm sure, with looking for decay in dark matter uh, in, say, the WIMP paradigm. Uh, this is exactly the same. So the morphology would be the line of sight integral of the dark matter density, not the dark matter density squared, because we're not looking at annihilation, but rather decay. And again, using morphology and spectral information, uh, there is a very good chance that you have a good enough telescope like this telescope that is proposed currently, you would be able to discover current Hawking evaporation of massive black holes. Yeah, sir, it's a really great paradigm. And maybe I can ask uh, one small selfish question. Like, uh, okay, so I'm asking that most people argue that why the dark matter is matter, like not some modified gravity, which can explain the uh, galaxy rotation curves, etc. Because of the power, uh, yeah, like baryonic acoustic oscillation, right? The third peak is almost similar to the second peak, so it more or less sells. Correct. So I am saying that if you are pro uh, positioning your stand as like, roughly, like I mean, say as dark matters are black holes. So could it be still explain the both halo as well as the so-called the CMB power spectrum, the third peak is the second peak. So that's what I am a little bit worried about. So that's why I was asking. Yeah. Great, great question, Santa. And the good news is that as long as black holes have formed, if they are dark matter, as long as they have formed prior to, uh, uh, you know, essentially at the moment when structures uh, evolve and separate, uh, uh, variants separate from the dark matter, which is about the CMB decoupling temperature. So if black holes are around by then, then everything is identical to the wind paradigm, right? So structure formation works exactly the same way with one key difference, which has to do with, with work I did when I was a graduate student many, many decades ago, uh, which is the cutoff to small scale uh, uh, structure. So the matter power spectrum of WIMPs uh, is cut off by the process of so-called kinetic decoupling, which is when WIMP dark matter uh, is no longer in, in uh, kinetic equilibrium, not in chemical equilibrium, rather kinetic equilibrium with the early universe plasma. And so that cuts off the matter power spectrum for WIMPs. Uh, for black holes, there's no such cutoff. Uh, and in principle, you have more small scale structure down to the scale of the sort of black hole or down to the scale where tidal disruption effects are in place. Uh, so structure formation for PBH works in exactly the same way as for WIMPs. These objects behave uh, like dust, so they behave exactly like WIMPs. These are non-relativistic at the time of structure formation. And uh, uh, you know, in as long as accretion onto the black holes doesn't distort the CMB, which is an effect that takes place only for very, very massive PVH. Uh, there's no problem in explaining all of the cosmological observations as well as the rotation curve observations. Yeah, thank you, sir. Actually, I was also worrying about the sub-horizon to super-horizon, like the spectrum are changing. So how would the black holes would do? Right. It's great to know that it would be coming. So thank you again, sir. But, um... So thank you, Stefano, for this nice talk. Uh, and I will share the schedule of other talks with you. If you want Thank you. Interested to join, then you can able to join it. Sir, uh, I have a question, please. Who? Yes. Uh, Gulam. Uh, yeah, yes. Prim sir, primordial black hole uh, could be a component of dark matter, but what is the exact role and mass distribution of primordial black hole? Yes, thank you for the question. So I have not discussed uh, the mass distribution uh, in this talk. And, and the reason is that uh, the mass distribution depends on the formation mechanism. So allow me to uh, go back uh, to that slide. Uh, just give me one second uh, where I talked about uh, formation mechanisms. Uh, let me see. Very good.
And again, unfortunately, I did not have time to talk about this, but any one of these formation mechanisms, in fact, produces a different mass function for black holes. Um, I can tell you that the collapse of large density perturbations typically produces a log normal mass function, uh, but that is not true in general. Uh, so, you know, critical collapse, for instance, leads to a very different type mass function. Uh, you can have power law mass functions as well. Uh, for instance, cosmic strings lead to a power law mass function. So, you know, unfortunately, it is not known what the mass function is, but you can uh, uh, you can go ahead and essentially use the monochromatic mass function results, as I explained, to put constraints on any mass function you like based on the formation mechanism that you assume. Uh, and the only thing you need to do is taking an integral of these constraint curves uh, and apply it to the mass function of interest. Is this clear, Gulam? Yes, sir. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Any... Thank you. Thank you, Gulam. Uh, Sayanta, I, I want to uh, post my email yeah, here so in the chat. In the and, chat and... box. If you want to write, right. me, you can directly. Please do reach out about any of the topics I've discussed. And again, sorry for going uh, beyond the hour, but it was a pleasure uh, to talk with all of you. And uh, I look forward to opportunities to either host you if you're ever on the West Coast of the United States or collaborate on any projects uh, that you think may be of mutual interest. Thank you again. Okay. So, bye, Sifano. Thank you, Sayanta. Bye-bye.